Good morning, everybody. I'm just saying everybody joining into today's Grand Rounds. Thank you for being here. Uh, hope you are enjoying. So uh, Dr. Jen just reminded me that today is the first day of summer. So happy summer. Uh, and it is also the so it is also the longest day of the year. So I hope you get outside and enjoy the sun as well. Um, also, I hope you had a, a restful and, and great long weekend holiday for Juneteenth. And of course, um, uh, take advantage of our, our Zoom uh, backgrounds for anything from Juneteenth Pride Month to, I think we also have some slides for summer as, uh, think, uh, as well. So we're trying to cover everything up and please uh, let us know if there's anything else we can do for fun. We love creating these Zoom backgrounds. Um, so anyway, thanks for joining us today. We have a very special Grand Rounds. I said it a lot. Again, I really mean that today. Um, it'll be the, the first of what will probably be a, an ongoing theme for forever in regards to AI and its use in medicine in so many ways. So it's kind of a, um, a very uh, meaningful talk we have today with Drs. Lee and Chen because it will be the first one we have along these lines of what will be likely many probably have Dr. Lee and Chen back uh, in the future uh, as well as they do uh, amazing stuff. Um, we don't have too many updates today, uh, which is uh, uh, always nice to not have anything uh, worrisome to update, but we also don't have any updates right now of any uh, certain events. I do want to mention, except for a couple um, a couple ones, uh, for our Department of Medicine faculty, we do have the uh, upcoming uh, uh, town hall with Dr. Harrington. As you know, we, our department chair, Dr. Harrington, uh, is now going up to become dean at Cornell School of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Bonnie Maldonado, which many of you I'm sure know very well, uh, it will be our interim chair and, and starting in the beginning of August. Uh, there'll be a town hall on Monday with our with our Dean Dean Minor, uh, just talking about uh, uh, that, that transition and Dr. Maldon not coming in and do please put in questions in advance and, and join us at 1230 on Monday. Uh, on that note, I, I sat down with Dr. Harrington with Bob and uh, and just wanted to know more about his decision to learn more about our, our outgoing department chair has been with us for so many years and to learn more about him, how he decided to make that decision, how it came up and advice to all faculty, all faculty and, and uh, new and, and, and most have been around for a long time. So that actually is coming out. It should be emailed right now to our community um, right at eight o'clock. So please take a look at that if you'd like. Um, and uh, again, thanks for, thanks for being here today. So with that being said, I, I just wanna mention next week's Grand Rounds, uh, Dr. Chin, Marshall Chin will be talking about applying an anti-racist lens to payment reform and care transformation to advance health equity. That'll be, uh, of course, online here. So we'll look forward to seeing you next week. That being said, coming back to today's Grand Round speakers, I'm gonna start with uh, Dr. Chen will be speaking first uh, and he and Dr. Lee will be presenting together. So Dr. Jonathan Chen uh, it leads a research group that seeks to empower individuals uh, with the collective experience of many uh, combining human and artificial intelligence approaches that will deliver better care uh, than either alone can do. Dr. Chen continues to practice for the concrete rewards of caring for real people to inspire this research, focus on discovering and distributing the latent knowledge embedded in clinical data. He co-founded a company to translate his computer science graduate work uh, into an expert system for organic chemistry with applications from drug discovery uh, to an education tool for students around the world. Uh, Dr. Chen also completed training in internal medicine and a research fellowship in medical bioinformatics and has published influential work in multiple high impact journals with awards and recognitions uh, from the NIH Big Data to Knowledge Initiative, National Library of Medicine, American Medical Informatics Association, uh, Yearbook of Medical Informatics, so many things that I married college officials, among others. Uh, Dr. Chen uh, believes informatics solutions are an important approach to systematically addressing challenges in healthcare and really tapping into real world electronic medical records and machine learning, things that we will be doing a lot in the, starting to do now a lot in the future for data analytics uh, to really reveal the, the knowledge that's in there uh, and close that loop on this continually learning healthcare system. Along with Dr. Chen, I have Dr. Uh, Ron Lee, who's also a clinical, who's a clinical assistant professor of medicine as well in, in our division of hospital medicine, also within the center of bioinformatics uh, within our department of uh, medicine as well. Uh, as the medical informatics director for digital health at Stanford Healthcare, he provides medical and informatics direction for the healthcare systems enterprise digital health portfolio, uh, including examining digital 
referral networks, and virtual care models. He's the co-founder and director of the Stanford Emerging Applications Lab, also known as SEAL, uh, which helps clinicians and staff build ideas into novel digital products. So really what's being transformed right now at Stanford and really improving our, our uh, and testing our care delivery at Stanford. His academic interests focus on delivery science of new technological capabilities, such as digital and artificial intelligence in healthcare, how to design, implement, evaluate, and uh, new tech-enabled models of care delivery. Dr. Ali's work spans multiple disciplines from clinical medicine, data science, digital health, information technology, thinking process improvement, really in every aspect of medicine. He's consulted the very companies in digital health and artificial intelligence, uh, leading work in AI using uh, experience in, in partnerships with such as with Google. And he's an attending physician on inpatient medicine service at Stanford. So um, both uh, Drs. Uh, Chen and Lee are uh, both in the division of hospital medicine with me, among other things they do, as I just mentioned, they're colleagues of mine personally, I've known them for years and I consider them good friends. So I'm really uh, happy to have been able to introduce them today and have them here this morning. So Dr. Zala, turn it over to you. Thanks for being here. I just wanna mention, this is our first, uh, again, first talk on AI uh, that we would likely have many in the future. So this is a very kind of important one, especially for me today, kicking us off in, in this new field that's going to, of course, I think we all know, be so important in the future. So thanks for being leaders in this space and being here to kick us off and, and talk about it. Fantastic. All right. Thanks so much, Aaron, for that kind introduction and always uh, great to have our collegial work together. All right, let's uh, kick this off. Good morning, everyone. Glad to connect for a discussion around some actively disruptive technology that is likely to change the way all of us do our work and live our lives. If you have not already tried things like ChatGPT or similar large language model AI systems, there are over 100 million people who already have. It's the fastest growing internet application in history. You need to go online, create a free account, and just start playing with these things and they will shock you with how capable they are. Even though I don't believe this is the right question to ask, but inevitably someone's gonna bring it up. So let's just fine, let's just say it. At this point, I mean, who is smarter, humans or computers? What does it even mean to be a doctor when now a publicly available general purpose chatbot can easily pass medical license exams? You can imagine the whiplash of reaction to some of these findings, including some of our own research findings within Stanford. You've had at least one educator who said, this, this technology needs to be banned. After all, when you give a medical doctor a degree, you want them to know medicine, not how to use a bot. A good or bad, ready or not, Pandora's box has already been opened and people are already using these tools for every imaginable and many unimaginable and unintended ways. Even if you're not using these tools, 90% of your students are. And they are already using it to do their homework, their take home exams, including directly submitting bot generated content without even attempting to edit it. Our existing models of education for training and testing people in terms of their ability to read and write text has been completely broken overnight and requires a complete overhaul. But that's not even just education. What about clinical practice? Despite a wall of superficial disclaimers against doing so, Patients are clearly already using these tools to, for medical advice and counseling, if not to diagnose and treat themselves and to diagnose their dogs. I gave a version of this presentation to the House Staff uh, Technology Council recently. One of the medical house staff said, wait, I don't understand. We are already using ChatGPT and ICU rounds right now. Are you saying we should not be using it as a medical reference? No, no, you should not be using this as a reference. That doesn't mean you can't use it. It can be a very powerful and useful tool, but you need to understand what these things are and what they are not. In a very crude sense, what they are, what it is, it's, it's autocomplete on steroids in a very simplified way. If you think about it as a simple example, if you go to your search box right now and you type in coronary artery, what happens next? Autocomplete pops up. The computer thinks, did you want coronary artery disease or calcification or a bypass graft? How does it do that? How does the computer know or guess what you wanted to say before you even finish typing your thought? What it's done is it's looked at the past thousands, millions of times people have searched for similar terms and it's memorized a bunch of word association parameters. 13% eh, of the time somebody searched for coronary artery disease, 
6.5% of the time, they search for coronary artery calcification. So it's guessing what you're doing by memorizing these parameters. Each one of these numbers is a parameter. It's memorized about how different words are associated with, with each other. But hey, why stop at just learning from search terms? What if you took every book ever published, every Wikipedia article, every newspaper article, every conversation on Reddit and Twitter, and you poured all of that text, all of those strings of words, and you poured them into a large language model to learn all of the ways that words are commonly associated with each other across the entire public internet. Well, if you could do that, you could start to grow an incredibly large system, memorize so many different ways that words are associated with each other. Why learn millions of ways? What if we learn billions, tens of billions, GPT-3, the model underlying the original version of ChatGPT, had 170 billion parameters it learned about words being associated with each other. They are not even disclosing it publicly, but most people speculate that GPT-4, the system underlying the most recent version, is probably has over a trillion parameters it's learned based on essentially the entire public internet. But then again, that's just bigger. Bigger doesn't mean better, That's or does it? One of the strange things that I think has surprised many people, including myself, is many of these systems are demonstrating emergent properties. You take the very simple concept of autocomplete, just guess the next word in a sentence, but when you've memorized enough examples and parameters about prior documents and how words are stringed together, it starts to be able to manifest very sophisticated capabilities like question answering, summarization, translation, generation of ideas, and even reasoning with a theory of mind. This seems very shocking, and yet maybe it shouldn't be that surprising, given that all of our intellectual and emotional thought that we prize so highly is expressed and communicated through the medium of language and words. I'm trying to make some of this concrete. I'm gonna blaze through a couple of examples here. The slides here are not as important. What you really should do is just go online, create an account, and try and play with some of these tools yourself, and that'll make it much more real and you'll see how surprisingly capable they are. One of the types of tasks that they're very good at is generating document drafts. Hey, chatbot, I got a medical student who wants a letter of rec for residency. Uh, they were on service with me for a week in service. Um, they overall reasonably reliable. And could you maybe add an endearing anecdote of how, how some family said they were going to be a great doctor one day? Type that into chatbot, boom, done. Instantaneously have a letter draft. Is it the best letter? No. Is it serviceable? Yeah, it really kind of is. Maybe it depends on how much you like this student. If you think more broadly in the scope of medical practice, it is quite conceivable we're going to have tools that will be able to draft insurance authorization letters or respond maybe to our overwhelming influx of in-basket in messages produce patient-generated histories, and I think in the not-distant future, it's going to be drafting our clinic notes for us. How about summarization translation, another very capable task that these um, systems are demonstrating? Hey, chatbot, I had a patient. They were here for an opioid overdose. We uh, gave them some naloxone, monitored them for dispre respiratory depression, ended up getting them on buprenorphine before discharge. Could you draft a discharge summary for me? Boom, done, instantaneously. While you're at it, Extract out the patient's home med list and put it in tabular format. Assign ICD-10 codes to this discharge summary that maximize our case mix index. And could you adapt this into a set of patient instructions so that we can give this to the patient and make sure it's written at a fifth grade reading level in plain English or plain Spanish or Vietnamese or Russian? All of these things out of the box, these tasks are quite capable and automatic at this point. Revising documents, also something it's quite capable of. Hey, chat, but I hacked together a draft of one of my paper abstracts here. It's not quite ready. The editor said they want it in structured format in less than 200 words. Could you re-edit this whole thing for me? Quite capable. Could you actually also rewrite in the, in the form of a specific aim I could use for my next NIH grant proposal and pull out the significance and innovation sections? Is it going to produce something good enough to be funded? Yeah, probably not, but... At the price of free and at the speed of instantaneous, it is a very powerful supporting tool. It is incredibly good now at these language manipulation tasks, drafting, summarizing, translating, revising. 
Before we get too excited, though, we must be aware of some caveats. These are language manipulation systems. They're not really knowledge systems, uh, or at least that's not the way they're intended to be used. These systems are highly prone to confabulation. Sometimes it's called hallucination. I prefer confabulation as a more medically accurate term because hallucination implies somebody who believes something that is not true. But these systems, they don't believe anything. They don't think, they don't know, they don't understand. What they are designed to do is to string together words into a believable sequence, even if they don't actually make sense what they're saying. That is confabulation, right? This is like your chatbot drank too much alcohol and has Wernicke Korsakoff syndrome now. Show you concrete examples. I asked the chatbot, hey, who are three of the most famous graduates of Stanford Medical School? Immediately comes back with an answer. And some people are like, oh yeah, Paul Berg, our Grand Rounds conference halls, Berg Hall, it's, it's named after him, very famous person. And he, let's see, oh, Nobel Prize in chemistry for recombinant DNA. Yeah, that makes a lot of, wait, wait a second, wait a second. Paul Berg didn't graduate from Stanford Medical School. Actually, he didn't graduate from any medical school. He wasn't a doctor. He was a research scientist, a very famous research scientist. Actually, double check all three of the people, very real, very famous people that it mentions. Not a single one of them graduated from Stanford Medical School. The system is just making stuff up. Worse than that is that it says it all in such a fluent and believable way. If you only read this answer, how could you possibly know the answer, the information was wrong, unless you already knew? The most effective lies and misinformation are those that hide elegantly alongside the truth. Well, how about... A medical question, a chatbot, explain how opioids are useful to improve mortality and heart failure and provide references. Now the bot tries to hedge a bit here. It says, well, I'm not sure that's actually true, but if you say so, okay, here we go. Here's how opioids help people with heart failure and here are references to back it up. So go search for these PubMed IDs, look up these references and you'll find that they, they aren't even real. These articles it's referencing do not actually exist. The chatbot is just stringing together author names and article titles into a believable sequence. So it looks like a reference. That's what it's optimized to do. This is dangerous specifically because how good these systems are at producing incredibly realistic content while seeming confident and credible. We are converging upon a point in history where human versus computer generated content, real versus fabricated information, you cannot tell the difference anymore. Imagine working with a couple of medical students, one of them who gives you their best guess and assessment and says, you know, I'm just not sure what the answer is. This is my best guess. You work with them. Compare that with another medical student who confidently bluffs their way through rounds, making up patient information as they go. Patients here for abdominal pain? Hmm, okay. So if they had any prior surgeries, yes, they had a cholecystectomy and an appendectomy three years ago. Okay. The white count elevated? Yes, the white count is at 15 today. Wow, okay. Well, that makes me think, wait, wait a second. Was all of that true just now or are you just making stuff up? What if the medical student told you, well, most of what I told you was true. I just can't tell you which parts were actually true. Like how much would you fear relying on this student? How dangerous would they be for patient care? So what are some approaches to address this? It doesn't solve all the problems, but actually these systems are not just autocomplete on steroids. Additional layers of techniques to try to refine them include instruction fine tuning, supervised learning. These are cases where here's a bunch of example questions and now chatbot, like here's an example of a good answer. We had humans write answers. Try to make your answers more like this. This would be a good appropriate answer to try to steer it towards what we would rather see in the type of answers we want out of a system. It turns out an even more effective technique is an additional layer of reinforcement learning with human feedback. You may have noticed if you ask a language model a chatbot the same question 10 times, it will generate 10 different answers. There's a certain randomness in its behavior because under the hood, it's just probabilistically generating sequence of words. One of the ways these systems have been improved substantially is they just hired a bunch of human workers here, chatbot, generate 10 different answers to the same question, and now humans rate them, which ones they liked more, which ones they liked less, to further nudge the system towards producing responses that are more aligned with human preferences, actually answering the question asked in a meaningful way while trying to avoid toxic bias or otherwise erroneous responses. 
still has not solved all these issues, but these are some of the techniques that others and indeed even at Stanford were trying to work on to optimize them further. So major limits and caveats, some techniques to work on them, still unsolved issues. But even with these caveats, I want you to consider not just where we are now, but project where we are going. This graph shows how well different language models have performed on medical exam questions over the past few years. A few years ago, I had students working on this problem, training a transformer model based on medical board exam questions, and let's see how well it can do. And a few years ago, systems like this were getting maybe 35% of the questions right. When I saw that, I'm like, oh, well, I mean, okay. I mean, that was an interesting little computer science class research project, but clearly nowhere near usable for real application. So I kind of stopped paying attention to this technology in the prior few years, because it just didn't seem that good. Clearly, we are now at a tipping point where the technological capability is popping. When the first version of ChatGPT was released, it was already out of the box, able to basically just barely pass the United States medical licensing exam. I heard some laments back then well, I mean, if you want a doctor who just barely passes the medical licensing exam, feel free to use this chatbot. This thing ain't smarter than me. My perspective was like, no, that's that's not the right way to think about this. What you need to think about is it's just barely passing now. A few years ago, it was completely unusable. You can project where this is going into the not distant future. And indeed, shortly after that, GPT-4, MedPalm-2 have been released, and now systems like this are handily able to pass medical knowledge multiple choice exams and scoring better than your average doctor would. Of course, being a doctor isn't about answering multiple choice questions. There's much more open-ended reasoning, and we have active studies going on right now that we publish soon describing surprising results even for that. But even next level than that, I have also heard some doctors respond, like, computers can do a lot but I have the human touch. You can't simulate the kind of empathy and connection patients need from their physicians. This was a fun study, came out last month. The researchers asked the chatbot to respond to a bunch of medical questions posted on an online forum and compared that to the responses that actual human physicians had written on the forums. They compared those two, they rated them and found that the bot generated answers were higher in both accuracy and in empathy the bot was nicer to people than real doctors. Limitations to this study structure for sure, but it does just get you thinking. I really appreciated this post by Kat Woods who very eloquently described how effective she's found automated chatbots to be for therapy and counseling compared to the human therapist she's worked with and who she liked very much. And she still thought the bot was doing a better job for her. I of course believe there's a special and unique value to the human touch and connection we can make with our patients. But what these examples tell me is that I don't think we as humans have as much of a monopoly on empathy and therapeutic relationships as we might like to believe. And why I fully expect for better and for worse that far more people will be receiving therapy and counseling from automated bots rather than live humans in the not distant future. And that is largely driven by an extreme mismatch between the demand, the need for such support services versus the supply of people of the people available to provide them. I'm sorry, conversion here. One major caveat before you start using these systems, make sure you do not just copy and paste real patient information into these online systems. When you do so, you are grossly violating patient privacy laws by uploading protected health information to a third party tech company. If you are interested in potential applications that integrate with real patient data, here at Stanford, we're one of the few early adopters. We actually have direct API access to the GPT-4 system, but housed within our hospital IT infrastructure so that it is safe and reliable so that we can send real patient information there to start testing it. Some of the active work that actually I'm coordinating right now is finding the right application use cases. We can start to test this out, see what it's capable of using real patient systems, clinical and operational use cases. Things we're exploring right now, responding to in-basket messages, automatically taking in patient histories, performing the chart biopsy, summarizing a case before they show up in your clinic, maybe triaging specialty referrals, if not full-on digital consultations. Much of this investigation is greatly facilitated through the advent of the Stanford Healthcare Data Science Team. With Nigam Shah, he's Stanford Healthcare's first ever chief data scientist. We are a team now that includes physician leads, such as myself, data scientists, 
technology professionals, product managers, but also we have ethicists, legal scholars, financial analysts, user experience and workflow modelers. We brought together this whole team of experts with support from all the way through leadership through the health system so that we can now actually translate concepts, AI systems into clinical practice in ways that are safe, responsible and effective. I'm going to pass this over to Dr. Ron Lee now, who co-authored our recent piece in JAM Internal Medicine, where we are considering that right now we are entering as a community, as a society, into a new era amidst an abundance of information, but a scarcity of time and human connection. While we must always be aware of hype and caveats, we're also hopeful towards the multiple levels of healthcare applications where we can expect large language model systems to substantially reshape our entire lives and certainly the practice of medicine. Thank you, I'll pass it over to Dr. Lee. Thank you so much, Dr. Chen. Um, let me go ahead and share my slides here. Well, thanks again, everyone, for joining us this morning. Um, yeah, this is a really exciting time. And, you know, I've, I've always told people who ask me, is this real? Is this actually a pivotal moment? Or is this going to be another stage of, of the hype cycle? And, you know, the answer is, I don't really know. No one really knows, right? I mean, I don't think anyone can really say that they've been experts in large language models and, and this type of AI for decades, because it hasn't actually existed until, or at the scale until fairly recently. Um, but I will say that uh, as a it's just as a human being in the world, I care about this, you know, in terms of how this will affect me and, and the world around me. Um, certainly as a physician, as Dr. Chen described, I think this will have an impact. How? We don't know, but it will have an impact. Um, and then also in terms of, you know, what I do for the health system, I work with Dr. Chen and, and other colleagues in terms of not just using, potentially using these technologies, but taking part in building them, um, implementing them, governing them. I think that it is helpful to realize that we have these concepts, but there's quite a bit of a gap between this concept phase and the phase that I think we all want to be a part of, which is being able to use these technologies to actually improve patient care. You know, I think about how when we first discovered, uh, just, you know, using a drug discovery example, you know, when we first discovered tyrosine kinase inhibitor, right, it opened up a ton of avenues for drug discovery, but it took years before we actually got a drug like Gleevec and Matinib and all these other you know, drugs that are saving lives. And, and I think a lot of it requires us to really take a step back and understand that mechanism of action. You know, what actually is happening when you deploy such a capability into the real world in order to, um, to make a difference. So that's what I'll spend a little bit of time talking about here. And, um, and I'll talk about some of the work that we're doing here at Stanford. So taking a step back, um, I, I actually wanna, I'm not gonna use the term AI in, in the next couple of slides um, on purpose here. And it's because I want to take a step back and focus on what really matters here, right? Which is we want to solve problems. We want to improve outcomes. That's why we're in medicine. And to do that, we have to understand what happens in the middle. What is in this, this dark cloud of what we call healthcare delivery that mediates all of these problems and turn them into some type of outcome, positive or negative? We know it's complex. We know there are a lot of people in here, technologies. It's messy, right? And, uh, and we have to figure it out in order to actually have a strategy for, for safely and effectively using these technologies. Well, let's break this down a bit more. Um, it's helpful to think about what's in this dark cloud as what's called a complex adaptive system. And I'll, I'll spend some time later describing what that is. And the system is not just technology, of course. I mean, there is technology, but there are tons of people who are involved in care delivery um, processes. So we call this a social technical system. And a few points to highlight about how the system behaves. Um, they're interconnected. So I think anyone who's part of any type of workflow, any organization, I think certainly any, any physicians or providers here, I think we have an intuitive sense of what this means. It just means that when we're actually on the ground caring for patients, um, everything relates to each other. If we do something, it'll affect the person next to us. And if we change a process, it'll certainly affect the people in the process. Number two, it's adaptive. So nothing is static. You know, we're, we're not lines of code in a computer program. We're human beings. We react to the environment. We adapt. We change. And as a result, this system will evolve. Um, and, and finally, because of all of this, it's, this is complex. And what that means is it's not linear. So if you change one thing in the system, 
you can't necessarily predict what will be the outcome, and certainly not in a linear way. Um, one of the uh, misconceptions that I, um, that I think we often make is we apply the rules of what's called a complicated system to a complex adaptive system. So on the left-hand side, you see an example of a complicated system. So what that means is you have a system with a ton of moving parts. So imagine maybe you build a really complex piece of software, lots of code, subroutines, et cetera, um, or maybe a really complex machine learning model. I mean, these are all complicated systems. Um, but compare that to you have to, you're responsible for building a clinical team. Uh, you, you start a new clinic with nurses, doctors, you have some technology in there as well. They're different, right? I mean, on the one hand, um, sure, you have a lot of moving parts and software, but if you change one part of the software, you, you kind of have a sense of how the software will behave. Whereas if you're responsible for managing a team, I don't think you can quite say that. So you have this difference between a predictable uh, behavior and what we call emergent properties of a complex system. Um, and then, of course, there's that interconnected piece. So you can see on the right-hand side, it doesn't look this, that dissimilar to an organism or a cell. And my view is that uh, a system of people, uh, an organization, is kind of similar to a living cell or, or an organism. It's actually more complex than that. So I think we should think about it that same way. How does that relate back to how we think about technology and how we should safely design and, and implement technology. Well, um, we have to acknowledge that when we introduce new technology like artificial intelligence, large language models, especially something as disruptive as large language models, um, it will perturb the system. That is a fact. It will definitely perturb the system and not necessarily in a good way. So we have plenty of examples, um, real world examples showing that. One such example is the electronic health record. So that is a technology that we had introduced into this complex system of care delivery as early as you know, 20, 30 years ago. And um, there certainly was an intent to improve efficiency, accuracy. And I think the initial implementers had some vision of how the system will behave. Maybe we'll all have better data. We'll all have you know, a certain way of doing things. And, some, and a lot of that has been realized, but at the same time, there are plenty of consequences, impacts, that I don't think anyone really predicted, some good, some not so good. The EHR not only changed how we document, but it actually changed how we work, how we think, it changed our communication patterns, even our culture, I would, I would argue, in medicine, how we think and use, uh, how think about and use data. And you know, some might even argue it, it was the EHR that even allowed all this research to happen in the first place, right? Because we actually had digitized data, which allowed us to develop machine learning models on healthcare data, which then opened up all of these other opportunities. Um, all of this is to say that when you introduce something, you have to think about the not just the immediate effect, but the second, third order, even fourth order effects. Now let's get a bit more into how this relates to uh, AI and large language models. When we use the term technology, often, especially here in Silicon Valley, we, we often think about um, specifically digital and information technology. And when we break down what that actually means, um, when we break down some kind of digital technology into its core components, whether it's a mobile app, electronic health records, an AI tool, what it really boils down to is you have some kind of information that's, you know, some kind of information that's either retrieved or organized. So like a Google search, right? It retrieves and organizes raw information, um, or maybe information that's generated by some kind of advanced uh, machine learning model like ChatGPT. So you have the information, um, you have a user experience, you have the experience that allows some human being to interact with that information. It could be as simple as a browser, but there are all sorts of other things that could impact your experience. And you have the user, him or herself, right? I mean, the person who actually uses the, the, the product, I would argue is actually part of the technology in some ways, um, where it is this human technology hybrid. So we have to think about all of these components and how they then fit into this system of people, processes, and technologies um, when we think about the functional design, the strategy of how we implement and ultimately how we think it will mediate the outcome that we want to achieve. Layering on large language models. So as Dr. Chen had described earlier, there are a couple of um, fairly unique characteristics of large language models that make them different from even the rest of the other types of machine learning models that, that some of us have been working with. So number one, um, large language models use language. It doesn't output just a number or some classification, 
but it outputs language. So the information that you're generating from this type of AI is very high dimensional. It's not just a, you know one number or one state versus another state. It's a whole paragraph. It's a conversation. So there's a lot of richness and uh, that goes into this information that makes this quite unique. It's bidirectional. So or it can be. I mean, if you build a large language model into a chatbot, you can actually talk to it. Um, talk in air quotes. So that also changes how that user experience could could come out could uh, be designed versus you know another, another type of AI and uh, dynamic. You know the information will change over time. So we have to think about these core components and these core characteristics as we're designing this type of product and integrating it into the system. I think it's helpful to think about this framework because it helps expand and define this opportunity space for innovation. So when we think about innovating with large language models, um, the opportunity is well beyond training the models, optimizing them, or even let's say implementing a model into some healthcare system. It's actually about redesigning the entire system. It's about, it's, it's everything that's in this boundary that you know, we've drawn here. Uh, it's it's thinking about what are the systems that are not possible now, but we can actually make possible if we had these capabilities. And uh, it is the systems view that I think really needs to guide our innovation strategy um, here at Stanford, other ac academic medical centers. Um, but I would say, you know, any anything that where you're using technology that involves people and processes. Um, and I think one of the special things about being at an academic medical center at Stanford is that we actually do this all the time already. Like we are delivering care all the time. So our job is to optimize these systems. So it it gives us an opportunity to think about how this actually works in the real world. In order to do that though, we do have to um, keep our fingers on the pulse of what's actually happening on the ground. I think that's really important. Um, we have to listen to our providers, the people taking care of patients or staff, um, meet them where they are, think about where their pain points actually are uh, without even thinking about AI. Um, and then create the culture and the organizational structure to be able to enable this type of ground level innovation. I wanna give an example of how we did this, not with large language models, with a, another type of machine learning model, uh, a project that we actually have live here at Stanford. Uh, I won't go into the details of the project too much, but I wanna make the point and show that this is how we adopt the systems view for, for an AI project here in a health system. Um, this was a project that uh, started when we wanted to assess whether we could use some type of machine learning model that predicts clinical deterioration and see if it could improve outcomes in our inpatient, uh, inpatient population. And it started with a more simplistic question of how do we implement a machine learning model, a, a predictive model, which kind of limited initially our thinking around what we can actually do. Uh, a lot of the conversations were about how do we create an alert for physicians and you know, something that's that, that at this point seemed actually to be only be a small percentage of what we actually did. Instead, we took a step back. So we used the systems lens. Uh, we expanded that opportunity space. And it led to a much broader question actually of how do we use AI to enable a whole new work structure? And we realized that one of the problems that um, existed not just here, but probably in health systems everywhere is that there is this traditional hierarchical physician nurse work structure where physicians identify people who are sick, they tell the nurses what to do, the nurses then execute, but it's kind of top down. It, it didn't really, it created bottlenecks that we knew were causing problems. So we then thought, well, the AI, these, these machine learning models, they don't have to just provide information or alert physicians. They could actually change the entire work structure. So we, you know, we designed a workflow that allowed physicians and nurses to actually work together on equal ground and then take care of the patients together. Um, all of this is to say, this is happening now. I think we've proven that the systems view could really help us design products that work in these complex systems. I'll just quickly show what this, what this looks like. You know, this is a, a build within our electronic health record that includes, that's driven by this machine learning model. We had to spend a lot of time even thinking about the words, the language that we incorporated into this product. And uh, what it does is that the machine learning model uh, alerts not just the physician, but the nurse. Um, it, enables this uh, collaborative huddle between the nurses and the physicians, which ultimately is actually what's mediating the outcome. In order to um, do this work, uh, you know, sensing a theme here, it's complex. And, and that complexity, in order to actually, you know, uh, acknowledge it and, and work with it, you have to be, 
you know, we have to be collaborative and we have to think about across all disciplines. So this is what I often call the clinical informatics stack. It just, you know, I like to think about this framework as a way to think about all the different disciplines that have to come into designing a product, uh, not just for AI, but really any type of technology product and implement it in this safe and effective way. Now, taking this type of framework back to how do we innovate with large language models in healthcare and how do we think about it at Stanford? Um, so one opportunity we have is to reframe the question from how do we implement large language models to the question of how do we use large language models to enable new care models, new business model innovations in healthcare. You now, one example is at least in digital health, we think about how do we change the traditional brick and mortar driven care model of like having the patient drive all the way to the hospital, see a, their provider drive back. Um, how do we change that to something that's easier to execute, you know, something that's higher quality, improves access, reduce cost. And then we know now that we have in our toolkits, um, new technologies, new technological capabilities. And it's important to be intentional about identifying what those capabilities are. So it's not enough to just say we have AI. No, we have to actually think about what is the capability that this AI is allowing us to, um, to, to use. So uh, initially we know that AI can help us classify different uh, states, we could predict numbers, but now we have generation. So we can generate text, we can generate images. So that's a capability that we know we, we now have and pair that with the digital capabilities. And how do we think about them as tool, as building blocks to create these new care models? Now that we do have a framework, um, it's important to think about how do you execute on this at a place like Stanford? Um, because this new technology, we're all collectively trying to build out expertise um, and in order to be safe and effective in using this technology, we have to find the right balance between bottom up and top down. And the reason why this bottom up framework is, is helpful because that's where the action is. All the real world problems um, and the implications of tech, they're they're at where the they're 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 located where the work is. So we'll have to actually kind of see where those ideas and solutions are, as well as the unintended consequences from the users, from the people who are taking care of patients. Um, when we're just starting out a development journey uh, without really understanding what that fully defined end product is, it's important to uh, use what's called agile. So this is somewhat new to healthcare. It's, it's more popular in the technology world, um, but it is important, I think, for us to challenge ourselves and shift our mindset to allow for this agile, um, this agile philosophy, which means that we have to build just the minimum viable product. We don't necessarily know what the end product looks like, but we have to build the MVP and then immediately allow the real world to give us feedback so we can build the next version. One way we're doing that is through the uh, Stanford Emerging Applications Lab, which is a group that we have here at Stanford. And um, it's a platform that allows clinicians to bring their practical knowledge and problem solving insights um, to test new technologies so that the things that we build are anchored on where the ideas are and where the work is. Um, so this is actually a screenshot of, um, of our electronic health records. So we have this, in, this development environment where we could create apps uh, all within the Stanford environment. We can test new technologies, test new interfaces and see how they actually work. How do these user interfaces actually work when we use them in care delivery? Um, I, I, I'll go, I'm gonna use this as an example of just how we're using Agile. Won't go into the app uh, in detail, but the, uh, I think the important point here is that when we develop new apps, um, we work very closely with our clinician co-developers, who is Dr. Kim and Dr. Forrester, two faculty members who work with us. And we have to focus on crafting a, a need statement that maps to a specific pain point. Um, and we start from scratch. We start from, you know, what do they really want to build? They can sketch out uh, a design and we actually build it into an app that we test. We then get feedback from users. So here's actually the chief resident of our, uh, the chief resident for um, surgery. And you know, he was testing this app and really gave very detailed feedback that then allows us to build a better app. And this cycle, this iterative cycle is what's important um, as we're laying around new technologies like AI. So this is some work we did with Google to apply user-centered design to help us identify what are the specific machine learning tasks that we can then incorporate into a product. And we hope that this is the kind of process that could, be, that could become the industry standard for how we build AI tools in healthcare. 
Um, so we'd like to spend the last couple of minutes just going through a case study. Um, this is how we're thinking about integrating large language models into a specific program we have here at Stanford uh, with electronic consoles. And it turns out that Dr. Chen has been thinking about this for a couple of years, even before large language models. So I'll turn it over to him to say more. Um, thanks so much, Ron. Let me just uh, get screen back up. You know, while some doctors have certainly expressed anxiety about AI taking their jobs, I, for, for one thing, I don't worry about that at all because as Warner Slack said, any doctor who could be replaced by a computer should be replaced by a computer. What that actually means is you cannot be replaced by a computer. You do far more than what a computer can do. And more so, rather than worry about job replacement, I instead imagine the opportunity to create supply to meet the unmet demands for access to healthcare. The most important scarce healthcare resource is not a medicine, it's not a machine, it's not a hospital bed. If you really need to, you can manufacture things. What there will always be an unlimited demand for is access to qualified experts who know what they're doing. Tens of millions in the US alone, let alone billions worldwide, have deficient access to medical expertise, and this shortage is only continuing to grow. So I've been envisioning for years a future where we have multiple tiers, for example, of clinical consultation support tailored to better match the needs of our individual patients. And now while it is true, if you need to have a surgeon cut you open, like, look, I'm sorry, like, I don't care how much AI decision support you give me, I'm not going to do your colonoscopy for you. You're just going to need to see that specialist, even if it takes months to get an appointment, which it does for many of our specialty clinics. Then again, the pandemic has shown us very often a, a video visit is enough to get patients what they need while sparing them the time and travel for an in-person visit. We're now growing out our electronic consultation systems where you can basically email another doctor or specialist, get an answer and expedite care within days rather than months. What I've been interested in the potential future is what if we could get to the point, you know, electronic consults are still bottlenecked by you need somebody on the other side of that email to answer it with very unclear reimbursement for how that person is supposed to do so. What if we could power another tier of digital consultation, consultation services to match exactly what's needed at all different levels? What if the next time you refer a patient for a consultation, we could automatically learn from the thousands of prior cases to offer immediate and personalized suggestions on what your patient is gonna need? Converting our medical records of individual care into reusable institutional knowledge that can empower individuals with the collective experience of the many. I've been pursuing this line of work for many years around building clinical recommender algorithms, similar to how Amazon and YouTube, you know, recommends and guesses what product or video you want next based on what other people have liked. The advent of large language models now adds the compelling potential of backing up such recommendations with automated explanations in plain English to answer consultation questions. I'm gonna pass it back to uh, Dr. Lee to discuss more where we're imagining some of this going. Thanks, Jonathan. You know, one of the nice things about being at Stanford is that you can create some synergies between what uh, Dr. Chen had described and what's actually happening in the health system. So it turns out that Stanford Healthcare, our health system, is actively solving this problem with our e-consult program, which is being spearheaded by our uh, digital health care integration team. And I wanted to just acknowledge Dr. Olivia G, who's actually a faculty member in the Department of Medicine and the medical director of this program. And as we're actively scaling up this e-consult program, we are asking ourselves, like, how do we actually improve specialist bandwidth so that we can scale the number of e-consults without overwhelming all of our specialists. And this is the opportunity. So we, how do we pair the foundational research questions that Dr. Chen had been asking for years and now layer around this new technology, uh, large language models, pair that with an operational and strategic need that we actively have in the health system. And this, this uh, opportunity is, well, what if we actually develop and test a large language model enabled e-consult application? It's an opportunity. So um, going back to the Stanford Emerging Applications Lab app library that I showed earlier, this platform allows us to quickly design and test such an application. So you see some of our other apps here that uh, any physician could actually, or physicians who are part of our testing group could actually access. And you click on the app. What it does is it uh, recognizes who you are. It uses your electronic health record sign-in credentials. It then uh, 
allows you to pull data from the EHR, that's the laboratory data, notes, medications, et cetera, to power this app. So if we had a hypothetical large language model app that a user could click on, it pulls relevant data, how would that work? Uh, would it be safe and effective? What are the real world considerations that we'll need to consider as we're developing products like this, not just at Stanford, but for the world? I'll end with just a couple of examples of how this could look like. And, and this is just something that I, um, I, I just use ChatGPT. So this is not what the app would do necessarily, but it's illustrative of what it can do. And something I just wanted to note here is that we don't have to start with uh, AI making decisions. I think we're actually quite far from that because of all the limitations that Dr. Chen had described earlier. But what we can do is leverage what large language models are good at, which is synthesizing information, reporting information, manipulating text, all the stuff that if we could do well, will make it much easier for our physicians to make better decisions. So here's an example of how uh, this, this uh, large language model, this, is, this happens to be ChatGPT with GPT-4, could work for, for example, a hematologist um, or a primary care physician who's referring, creating an e-consult question for a hematologist. And I just underline the prompt here, which is help me identify additional data and context to include as this primary care physician is typing up this question. So nothing about giving me an answer, but it's simply just let, help me generate a better consult question so the specialist well, it'll be easier for the specialist to answer it for me. Um, so you can see that it's it's not bad. It's not perfect. I mean, definitely requires editing, but it's not bad. It, it certainly will save a lot of time. And I'm really curious to see what this will actually look like if we have people use it in certain situations. Similarly, um, if you're a consultant and you receive a consult question, um, you could ask the AI to, to extract the most important data um, even generate a differential, but then keep in mind that there is confabulation. So it's not something that you would ever use to automate your workflow. But again, what would actually happen if you had this available? What are the types of things that a user would consider to make this safe and effective? I thought a bit about how to end this presentation. Um, and you know, I actually, every time I, I, had, I had this conversation with myself, I actually always thought back to this painting here. Um, so this is uh, a painting by Sir Luke Spiles. Uh, it's called The Doctor. I think the first time I saw this painting was when I was an intern uh, as a medical resident here at Stanford. And what this painting shows is it shows a, a doctor, I think, in the Victorian age. Um, he's looking at a sick child in her home. And then you actually see in the background uh, the father and the mother's laying down. They look pretty helpless. Um, you know, they're they're actually not even that important in the photo themselves. It's really about this doctor and this, pa and this patient. Um, and what it often is, it's often used to show, you know, the ideal, the sacred relationship between doctors and patients, the values of the ideal physician because of how focused and present this physician is. But uh, the, the um, artist actually intended for this painting to show something else, which is the inadequacies of the med medical profession at the time. You know, as note, the parents are actually in the background. They, they, they're not participating at all. And I, I don't think, you know, at the time, there wasn't much you could do for as many conditions aside from just watching and waiting. So we're, we're in a different era now, right? I mean, we have advances that would have seemed miraculous um, in the Victorian age. And uh, we're now at a point where technology is quite inseparable from how we practice medicine. But as we all know, this technology, uh, even before AI, but certainly now with AI, it does risk taking us further away for our patients. So I think that's why it's important for us to uh, take a step back and, you know, think about with this, with this technology, how do we navigate this landscape with a clear vision so that the tech is not going to create more barriers to our core mission as physicians, which is to treat, to heal, to connect, but to enable it. And uh, that's why I think as, as providers, you know, we can't just be passive users, but actually active builders who will help shape this technology and return us back to the bedside. So with that, I'd like to just, you know, really call out all these people, all the people and the organizations who've been working with us, too many to name, maybe it really is, it takes a village to do this work. And uh, we'll have to take the rest of the time to answer questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Lee, Dr. Chen. Um, I just want to hi highlight, we definitely have had 
more people joined with a new recent record as far as number of participants watching. No surprise, this is such an important topic. We also have, again, no surprise, about 25 questions already that have come through. Uh, Dr. Chen's been answering a bunch in the type as well while you've been talking, Jonathan, uh, uh, Ron. So, um, but I do wanna to try to get to a number. Uh, one important question I think, so Dr. Golden asked this at the very beginning and, and one of the questions I had that, that I wanted to get both your puts on, he asked, when will primary care be 100% AI? Or, but just in general, in medicine, what is, this going to have, what's your opinion that this is going to have on how we practice medicine in the future? I know, I remember 20 years ago, people were fighting about how the internet is going to change everything and people were worried, we're all going to lose our, everybody's going to nothing and none of that happened really. But then people are saying, but this is different. Um, I was in, I was actually comforted to see your answer, Dr. Chen. Can you maybe first elaborate on this one here from Dr. Lee? What's the future of medicine with AI? Are we going to be replaced? So nobody's being replaced, but your job is going to change, right? Your job, your job will not change, but your tasks will be replaced. I actually think the internet is a very good analogy here, right? The internet didn't like result of robots taking over the world, but a lot of skills you had before the internet, you remember, did you used to have an encyclopedia once upon a time? Like that's just like an irrelevant object now. A lot of skills and memorization knowledge just don't make sense in the post-internet world. I think this is a similar type of technology where language manipulation before and post this development is just gonna change the way you work. It doesn't replace you. You do a lot more than manipulate language to be a good primary care doctor, but it's gonna change the way you do things. I'll turn to Dr. Lee. Agreed. Um, our job will change. And I think this is the message that we have is that we have to take part in the conversation to help na help our profession navigate this and uh, impact how this, how this technology will change our jobs. It will change, but I don't think it will replace because because it's so complex. I think that complex system that we were describing earlier, it's way more than any one technology could handle, um, but it will change. Uh, I have a question here from uh, Dr. Walker, who is the uh, Assistant Physician Chief for Kaiser Permanente uh, in Technology Innovation, uh, also previously at Stanford here. He asked, specifically Ron, you, you talked about this, this the work for the SEAL uh, team, uh, it's a cool name. And uh, how do you decide how long to iterate on a product or project? When do you start feeling like there's diminishing returns? Uh, so many needs in healthcare with so many people. Thanks. That's a great question. I mean, there's no rule per se. Um, I think it highly depends on the users, what we're testing, um, how high risk the product is that we're creating. So there's no rule per se. I think you know we all think about the, the optimal uh, cycle time. So it, it gets to a point where, for example, if you're, well, one, it's just the, the cycle time of the number of cycles, right? So the cycle time can't be too long because then, then the feedback gets stale. The number of cycles, of course, you know, if it gets too many, then you exhaust, uh, I mean, everyone's busy. So our physicians are actually busy taking care of patients. We can't extend it too long. So I wish I can give you a better answer than uh, just saying that it depends, but it just depends on what we're building here. And if we're something like, you know, if we were to build a large language model enabled app, I imagine that we'd have to have many cycles before actually using it if we are going at all, because we're dealing with so many unknowns here. Excellent. Uh, this next question, Jonathan, uh, specifically to you, in response to your answer, it seems like the right time to spread the scary info that uh, unknown people are getting to decide what is the quote unquote truth in AI seems ripe for specialty society statements that are only trained for professions should be, should be those arbiters. Uh, are there any need to be transparency to the public and how the truth was decided? Do you know if specialty societies are doing anything to sort this out? Yeah, great, great. Then this is Bob Teresha at a key question. It's like, hey, wait a minute. You know, where is this stuff learning from? The public internet? What's out there? Anybody can post anything there. Oh, well, it's not just the public internet. Remember they had humans giving example answers and rating the answers to steer it in a quote unquote better direction. Hang on a second. Who are these humans who are rating and nudging the system in what direction? Right now it's big tech companies just hiring workers probably in a developing country and paying them minimum wage is what's probably happening. Uh, maybe you would actually want certain professional experts involved for certain content areas. And that was a large purpose of this conversation today is I want to get you all, you know, wake up a little bit and get involved and lead this conversation unless you want tech to be driving this. Because I think a lot of certainly special societies haven't figured out how to drive this. But I like medical professionals be the one to be leading how this impacts healthcare and not tech companies. Uh, this next question is from uh, Dr. Turkin. Michael, Mike, thanks for being here. Uh, given clinicians and students are already using this technology, 
How do you think undergraduates and graduate medical education will need to adapt to ensure responsible and effective use of this technology? He also mentions, thank you for the insightful, engaging talk. Yeah, I, I don't know if like Eric Strong was on because uh, he, he's thought a lot about this uh, and others, Peter Basavia, Ron, do you want to take a stab? I'll follow up. Sure. I, yeah, I mean, as, as, as Jonathan had mentioned, I mean, there are educators who are actively thinking about this. Uh, again, all we can say is it will change. I don't know exactly how it will change. Um, that being said, and you know, I think to Jonathan's point, people are already using it. I think not allowing people to use it is probably not the uh, not the option here. So it's probably going to be, you know, my opinion is that we'll have to we'll have to spend a lot more time training students to think back to first principles. I mean, if you think about how medical education is organized, it's so much of it is memorization, pattern association. That's going to be a commodity. I mean, this is something that ChatGPT and other large language models can actually do fairly well, associate concepts and words together. So that's probably not how I would spend my time as a medical student, but really understanding how, you know, a, a, a cell works and how that, you know, translates into a liver function and how that translates to disease, like that mechanism, those concepts, that's still going to be important. And that's not quite, I think, how these models work. And of course, being able to translate those concepts into an actual thing that you can do for your patients, all of that, um, you know, will define what who we are as doctors. But I think it just means that we spend less time with uh, memorization and, and more time on that. If it's okay, I wanted to go a couple minutes more in, into nine, if that's okay. I know we start to lose people here, but we're recording this and share it to everybody. Um, I want to jump back over a little bit in some of the answered questions, because there are some great answers you put in there, Jonathan, and, and uh, some great questions. There was a couple questions along the, the theme of, one was, is there some sort of confidence interval that they may put into the query responses or someone here is talking about uh, great presentation. How do you, you know, some of these questions and some of these things can be risky pulling out references and interpreting films, for example, is there a way to quantify the risk in using AI, especially as it's still relatively early in phase. It was amazing to see how chat G 3.5 to four changed so much. Imagine how much more growth there is. Yeah, although active question like, can you grow much bigger than GPT-4? Right? Eventually the internet runs out, right? There's nothing more to learn on, but um, a very dynamic field right now. And some of the push isn't maybe we shouldn't be bigger models, we should be making more efficient ones. Um, for our prior generation of AI, like supervised learning, what's the probability or risk you'll have a stroke next year? There are ways you can put confidence intervals around that. For these language model tasks uh, approach, I would say open research. I mean, there, there are definitely people trying to give it some qualification about I'm more sure of this, less sure of that. I don't think it's been very well solved at this point. And then even if like it gave you even if it said, I'm unsure and sure about this, like how do you know it's not making that up too is kind of the current state of where we're at. There was this question asked earlier as well that you, you answered, uh, how are we sure, and you mentioned this at the beginning that chat GPT is gonna help us with all sorts of administrative things and health insurance, so on, talked about this, the, the letter of recommendation. Is there a possibility that we, that we still need to learn from the how the internet and, and EHR really made our job so much more difficult in many ways and stress. Is, is ChatGPT only going to make it less stress or that's a, a long, la, uh, language, large language models, not just ChatGPT, but any of them, are they going to make things only better or will it also possibly add more work to our, you know, I certainly have patients literally bring it in the ChatGPT responses and their question queries <laughs> already. The ch challenge you, Dr. Osdalga, sure, but Dr. ChatGPT said this, who are you going to believe now? Um, so I, I think Abraham Verghese, I don't know if he's on, he really kind of foresaw this years ago. We wrote a perspective, I posted it in the answers, where he's like, well, the prior generation, we got totally just run over by EMRs. That turned us into the most expensive data entry clerk in the hospital. Um, how do we not have AI do something like that to us again? Again, that's why we need to get ahead of it. We need to be part of the ones who are designing and defining what our appropriate uses in healthcare, because I am actually, I don't know, naively techno-optimistic. In the big scheme of things, technology actually makes all of our lives better on average, eventually. In the near term, though, it tends to be very disruptive and it tends to hurt and displace people in the meantime. And so we should be directly aware of and mitigate those harms along the way. And to add to that, um, I think there is going to be a relationship between the amount of information that's, that's generated and inserted into the healthcare system and the likelihood of our jobs getting harder or just work getting more burdensome. I mean, that's basically what happened with the electronic health record. I don't think anyone intended for 
that technology to in increase burden. But what it did do is it just increased the amount of information that's now available. And with information, something has, someone has to do something with that information, right? Um, and that I think has resulted in many of the workflow challenges. Even, you know, we have, there's a lot of popularity around things like the Apple Watch, remote monitoring sensors, et cetera. You know, one of the challenges that um, providers face now is, well, we can have all this data coming in and we got to do something with it. So with ChatGPT and large language models, who knows? I mean, you will have more information, but you also now have a tool to do something with that information that's different from anything we've had before. This is why I think we're arguing we need to see how this actually works in the real world. We have to use Agile to see at a very in a very small scale what's happening to the users. How do we design the interfaces to mitigate some of these risks? Because otherwise, I do think that could be a possibility. Uh, Dr. Sli and Chen, at the beginning of this talk, I, I mentioned this will be the, the, the first of our many, and we're certainly going to have you probably have you back a lot throughout your careers. I think we may have to bring you back sooner than planned. We still have like 20 questions that I'm sorry we didn't get to. Lots of amazing uh, uh, comments on how important this is and just the, the number of participants here. It just all says how important this is and important the work that you're doing is. Thank you so much for being with us today. I do, I'm serious about that. I do want to bring you guys back if, you, if you're for, uh, soon to talk more. Um, and, uh, and we're looking forward to hearing all the great stuff you do and, and that happens in the space. Thanks everybody for being here. Have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much. We'll catch up soon. Thank you. The preceding program is copyrighted by the Board of Trustees of the Leland Stanford Junior University. Please visit us at med.stanford.edu.